Hello, everybody. I think I can <clears throat> more or less follow Peter's introduction word for word. I, too, am an emeritus professor. Uh, I also think that most of you know me. My name is David Brailsford. I'm emeritus professor at the University of Nottingham. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce the first keynote speaker and to be able to say that <clears throat> it's very largely due to him that we are all here today. I think you could cast your mind back just over 25 years now to the formation of Adobe. Because for those of you that don't know, and I have no time to go through all the details, consult Wikipedia where there is an excellent CV for our distinguished speaker, Dr. John Warnock. <clears throat> but broadly speaking, he and his friend, colleague, Chuck Geschke, were there in the glory days of Xerox Park at the end of the 1970s and early 1980s. Like many other people there, they became very frustrated at Xerox's total inability to exploit what they were creating. And they left in late, late 1982, and the rest, as they say, is history. They founded Adobe. Certainly for me, Adobe and John first came to my attention with a moment I will never, ever forget. It was a nine-inch Macintosh screen in early 1985, driving on the Apple Laser Writer, which had got Adobe PostScript embedded inside it. And of course, the processor speed and the general spec of that laser printer were far in excess of those of the Macintosh itself. And it just changed everything. I mean, there was this beautiful typography, and even the boot-up page was a work of art. Do you remember? You, you started off the laser writer, it threw out a page with beautiful curves on it, and actually told you how many pages you'd printed so far on this thing. And <clears throat> very shortly thereafter, the language that was doing all that, PostScript, it really did change the world. Because I think it's fair to say that the Apple and LaserWriter combination did kickstart the desktop publishing revolution. And within the next 45 years, John and his colleagues managed to just conquer also the professional newspaper, magazine, print, publish industry totally. And by 1990, the world really had changed for good. But I think in setting the scene for today's talk, rather than the originator postscript language, which is still there, of course, what happened in the early 1990s, I think, was very significant. John and his colleagues, as again, I'm sure we all know, came out with a more compact, more linearized, more static, but very portable document format, PDF, based on the PostScript imaging model. And I believe, he's just told me, I think last time we looked, there, were, there seemed to be 200 million PDFs available on the web. I think it's now something more like 500 million are there. It really is a success story if you want accurate representation of documents. No matter how technical, no matter what the color space is, PDF is the de facto standard, and there it is. But round about the same time, of course, we had HTML and we had the web. A very, very different model, much more flexible, much lower quality, pretty good at what it does in some ways, but drives you mad at times. And these two standards for the past 15 years have been kind of moving along together, not getting in each other's way too much. And I think many of us feel, well, there's a gap in the middle that needs to be addressed. There's going to be some issues that sooner or later we cannot brush under the carpet. And I honestly think we are at a 1985 moment again because the thing that is changing the world, in my view, are these tablets. Uh, which are changing everything. But I was delighted, therefore, by the title of John's keynote address, which is The Evolving Form of Documents. And I'm pretty sure that some of the things I've alluded to is exactly what worrying him and Adobe just at the moment. So will you please give a very big welcome to John Warnock. Thank you, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really happy to see sort of the age of the audience. I expected some older people, and there aren't many, so that's great. Uh, so I'm going to go into a little history about why document creation you know, on computers sort of became the way that it became, and give you try to give you a little insight into uh, what happened. So today, 
after 30 years, uh, documents are almost completely computer generated. There's the old world of paste up and ruby lith and waxers and things like that that my wife, who's a graphic artist, understood very well, have gone away. They've been replaced with computer tools that allow you to completely control type, illustrations, color, uh, half toning, uh, and, and documents have advanced from that to contain multimedia components, animations, all manner of audio, all kinds of things. So the world has become a much more complex place. And we're finding that most of the documents uh, are computer generated. And that's sort of allowed for the elimination of a great, huge, huge number of paper workflows that exist in commerce today. Uh, so how did all that happen? It all really started to happen in a serious way at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which is not very far from here. Uh, this was during, it started during the early 70s when a lot of the ARPA community chief scientists were hired by Xerox to form the Xerox Palo Alto Research. They all came together in, a, in one place and the, the charter was to build the office of the future. So what they built during the 70s was way before the PC, way before the Apple II, way before any P home computers. Everyone at Xerox Park had a personal computer with a graphical user interface, a raster bitmap display, a keyboard, a mouse, and an external hard drive. They were all connected by Ethernet together. They all had access to file servers had both black and white and color laser printers that were invented at Xerox Park, And they had the first word processors. What you see is what you get kind of word processors. We called it Bravo at Park, and that later became Word because Charles Simone, who invented Bravo, went to go to Microsoft to invent Word. Uh, we had mail programs that look almost identical to the mail programs that you have today. Now this is 30 years ago on inconceivably small machines. There isn't a phone that doesn't have 100 times the power that these machine ha machines had. So what did this look like? Well, this was the Alto. And the Alto had a display that looked like a printed page. Now Xerox was in the copier business. And so as you, if any of you are old, of, which you're not old enough, but any of you remember the early Xerox ads, it was how mir miraculous the pages copied with the, with the Xerography process. So Xerox cared about documents and they cared about topography. So you have an eight and a half by 11 screen and you composed your documents on that screen by typing and backspacing and you had your first text editor and you would save the document off and you would send it over the ethernet to a laser printer. In that case, it was a Dover and it would print at 60 pages a minute. And this was in 1970s. Steve Jobs visited one day at Park and it blew his mind. So he left, hired a bunch of the Park people and started to build the Lisa computer. Lisa computer didn't get a lot of things right. So then he started to build the Macintosh. Uh, Microsoft finally figured out, looked at the Apple, and then they sort of copied that. But all of sort of the document technologies and the environment you live in today was sort of first started at Xerox Park. So how did type work at this? So the, the bitmap display was really black and white. There were only two states on the display. It didn't have any grayscale capability. And the tablet, or the, the page, was, was a, had a density and a resolution of 72 dots to the inch. So a 12-point type looked like the top line. And when you printed it on the printer, it looked like that because the printer was 240 dots to the inch. Now, how did you make type? Well, you made it bit by bit. You made each little matrix for each little letter by hand. And so if you wanted 12-point type, you made a, a face for 12-point type. If you wanted 14-point type, you made a face for 14-point type. 
and they made a complete suite of about six typefaces for both the 72 dot per inch display and for the 240 dot per inch printer. Well, the Alto became sort of long in the teeth, and so they started to make other machines. So they, the second machine was the Dolphin, and then there was the Dorado. And these two machines were different, okay? They had different resolution displays, different format displays, and they had different uh, color, they had color capabilities. So they were color displays. They also had different printers that were at different resolution. So this caused a problem. Uh, so Chuck Geschke started a, a laboratory called the Imaging Sciences Lab, and we were, he hired me, and we were chartered with exploring device independent graphics and printing protocols and worked on a project called Interpress. And the whole point of this was how can we avoid redoing this huge amount of work on typefaces for every new device that comes down the line? Because it was a huge amount of work, and if you really wanted a thousand typefaces, you're talking about an incalculable amount of work to bit tune each little typeface. Well, we worked on Interpress, but we could never resolve the fact that type and graphics were different. So type was one thing, graphics were another, and in Interpress they were kept separate. And it was, it was an extraordinarily difficult problem to try to bring these two worlds together. We, we failed at, at Xerox, but we founded Adobe and we started working on the PostScript language. And this was uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, First of all, we said, let's make PostScript a full programming language. Let's not leave out anything. Let's put in conditional statements. Let's put in lit, uh, loops. Let's put in data structures. Let's put in the whole nine yards, mathematics, sines, cosines, all of that stuff. Uh, so PostScript we designed as a full programming language. And we decided we had to make text and graphics under a unified imaging model. And what that meant is that we had to make text represented as outlines. In other words, they were analytically represented as character shapes. And then the insurmountable problem was how do you rasterize those so that they look good? Well, we figured out a way to do that. And it, it was based on simply of one simple idea. You don't take an outline shape and figure out what bits to turn on. You squeeze and deform the outline shape so that it produces good looking characters relative to the raster. And that's the simple idea that made it all work. So now you could rotate text, you can scale text, you can shear text, you can do anything you want with text, and you can take the rest of the graphics on the page and do the same thing. And that was the PostScript imaging model. Now, the most important thing that we did was we made the representation device independent. What does that mean? The document depends on no information about the device. When you have a PostScript file and you send it around the network, or you take a PDF file and you send it around the network, it has no knowledge of the device it's going to be rendered on. Keep this in mind. This is probably the most important thing that PostScript and PDF accomplished. Also, we punted on character encodings. We said we cannot have the language depend on a specific character encoding because there were no universal standards. Unicode was, I think, somebody's faraway dream at that point in time. There were multiple standards on the Microsoft platforms and on the IBM platforms and on the Apple platforms. They were all different character encodings. Japan had two standards for character encodings in Japan. China, I don't know what was happening at China at that point, but when we anticipated that we would have to go into Arabic, Devanagari, all these wild languages that had different typesetting rules, vertical and horizontal typesetting rules, 
And so we said we have to make a general enough structure to adapt to all of that, which we did. So what happened? It was first introduced in 1985 on the Apple Laser Writer. And as, as David pointed out, uh, that, uh, that shocked the typesetting world, <laughs> terrified the typesetting world, and, uh, and uh, uh, really democratized publishing. Uh, we did one thing when we had announced it on the Apple Laser Writer. We also announced it on the Linotronic 100, which had a 1,200 spot per inch, was a 1,200 per spot per inch photo typesetter that would take a postscript page and take exactly what you had on the laser writer and render it at very, very high resolution on the, on the uh, Linotronic 100. The first edition of the postscript manual was printed on the Linotronic and that's the way it worked. In 86, digital equipment, which then became Compaq, which then became HP, uh, licensed postscript. De DEC was a big company in those days. In 87, IBM and HP licensed Postscript, which was the end of the game. Once they licensed Postscript, it, the floodgates opened. In 1990, there were 31 printer manufacturers that supported Postscript, and they produced 110 products. In 1990, Microsoft decided they were going to compete, and so they came out with their version. Not one single printer pr shipped from, from Microsoft. In 1991, I had a crazy idea of how to take a postscript file, which didn't have everything you need to sort of print the page, uh, and sort of flatten it, and turned it over to my best data structure guys and said, design a format that has legs, that can be extended, that can adapt to new things. And Peter Hibbard and uh, Richard Cohn and Doug Bratz came up with the PDF file format, which has evolved and evolved and evolved. So in 1993, we, have, we announced Acrobat and PDF. And uh, at first, nobody f could figure out what in the hell this was good for. Uh, so, you know, it just, it sort of, there were some government agencies that loved this thing, okay? The Center for Disease Control said, we can send documents all over the world instantly talking about outbreaks of contagious diseases without having to print them and ship them, and this is going to save a lot of lives. So they adopted very early. The IRS adopted very early. Uh, today, each reader release has about a half a billion downloads. So it just gets downloaded constantly. Currently, there are about 550 million PDF files on the web. Uh, PDF has grown a great deal to try to adapt to the multimedia world. It now incorporates video, 3D, annotation, OCR for scan documents, which is great, uh, signatures, collaboration, interactive meetings. I, I know now that most of the documents I signed, I signed electronically. These, since they're encrypted, they can't be modified. They're much more secure than paper documents. And we have all become a national archive standard for documents. The cool thing about PDF is it just works. You just send a document, and you can open it and read it, and it works. There are substandard implementations of the reader that some aspects of the readers don't work. I would like to see that change. Well, now we've got the proliferation of devices, okay? We have cell phones. We have tablets. We have tablets in all sizes and shapes. Uh, we have big screen computers. We have small screen computers. We have portable computers. And my take is this is like paper. When you t give a graphic artist a format and you say, I want you to design me a card that will serve this function. They design for that size. So they will, depending on the content, the way that it goes into a specific format is radically different for various, for various size devices. The kind of information you present is different 
Uh, the way you present the information is different. If it's a link document, the way you handle the links is different. So here's an example. This is the New York Times on the web. It's a multi-column, but there are various widths. And this is, a, a sense, a static design if you're going to the web, to the NewYorkTimes.com website. It has layout. These are actually videos that are embedded in it. And for the most part, if you really pin print this thing out and, and gather all of it, it's about 400 yards long going down the screen. So you scroll down and scroll down, and you get the various sections and in, in the various uh, <coughs> layouts. Now, if you download the Times Reader, which is an Air application that was written in with Adobe's tools, uh, you get a very different kind of window. This, if you if you make the window wide, you'll get the one on uh, the one on the left. If you start shrinking the window, making it narrow and narrow, the page relays out. You'll notice this uh, this picture gets smaller. It spreads two columns and the reflow, some things get collapsed. And uh, if you go down to the far side, you'll see summaries in a linear form in one column. Now, I think this is probably a model for a lot of the ways that the magazines deal with the world. So now, if you go to the next uh, representation on a phone, this is my phone. I use an Android phone. Uh, the New York Times on a phone app. Now, why is it a phone app? This isn't a web page. This is a phone app. And now most of the magazines and most of the documents you see don't deliver their content via the web. They del deliver their content via an app. And that app is crafted for the device, and it shows on the device in a very, very specific way. And you have to ask yourself why that's the case. I looked up for just the new Android devices. So there are about 50 of them here. And I said, gee, are these devices consistent along any dimension? And the answer is no. They all have very, very different resolutions. They have different formats. They're all small. Well, except for the tablets, they're all small. So there's you can categorize them in three broad categories. They're sort of small, medium, and large. OK, so if I'm a document designer and I really want to serve all of the device markets, I have to design for small, medium, and large. Because, So I tried to do this. I've been writing HTML for a long time. And I got into my HTML5 manuals and got into the CSS3 stuff and went and got my favorite supplier of books about that, which is O'Reilly, and, and start reading about it. And in that book, they suggest that you have a CSS file for every device. Well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so let's talk about HTML. HTML was first mentioned by Ber Tim Berners-Lee in 1990. 1995, HTML 2.0 came out. 97, HTML 3.2. And 2008, HTML 5, which is an evolving standard. And this one has been touted as the future of the web. So everybody says, gee, you don't need things like Flash and stuff like that. You can all do everything you want and all your heart's desires in HTML 5. Well, I don't know. When HTML does not work well across a large range of devices. I'm sorry, it's just the facts. And it's because HTML has a fundamental design flaw. This is at the lowest level. There is a design flaw in HTML. It started with HTML with from Tim Berners-Lee representation. HTML is device dependent in the worst possible way. Size of H, you, you cannot draw in HTML a one inch square, nor can you set 12 point type. So pe all people know that 12 point type is readable. You can't set 12 point 
in HTML. Size in HTML is only relative to a pixel, which is dimensionless. It doesn't have any dimension. Size is only determined by the specs, screen width in pixels, screen height in pixels, and pixels per inch of the device on which the page is being displayed. So you have to be aware of the device that's being displayed to have any control over size. <coughs> As a designer, you have no control over the absolute size or the viewable size of anything across all devices. As a matter of fact, if you don't know the device you're going to, you have no idea what size it's going to be. The designer only has size control when targeting a very specific device, which there are thousands. I call this a fundamental design flaw. Absolute size matters in designing a document. A business card is different than a greeting card, is different from a magazine page, is different from a newspaper page. They are different sizes. They're all handheld, but you design them differently. Type size on a handheld document determines readability. And you don't have control over that. Shrinking and enlarging a document only works in a fairly fixed range. All of you who have phones will see this teeny blot on the middle of your screen, and then you will zoom in and scroll around until you can figure out whether you can read something. Fortunately, there is a simple fix to HTML. Define a pixel in HTML to be 1 72nd of an inch and allow for fractional, fractional pixel positioning. Modify the browsers to enforce this definition, but also allow for scaling of content on the screen. So now, if this were the case, then you are magically device independent. You don't have to know about any specific device because the, rest, the browser will render at the right size. You're only designing against one criteria, the size. You're not, if you think about it, resolution has nothing to do with anything. It's not a useful concept. It doesn't tell you anything useful about how to do something. This will allow for a unified device-independent imaging model across all resolution, including printers. Remember in the early days of HTML when you sent a, a page to a printer and it came out as this little teeny thing? Because the res resolution was radically different than the resolution of the display. Designers will be able to design for screen sizes instead of resolutions. They will finally be able to specify 12-point type. And they only have to specify it once. Why use CSS and styles and shapes to worry about specific devices? Why don't we worry about something substantive? So the other thing is hundreds of current workarounds, blogs, will not be needed because the, the web now, I, I went around, there are hundreds of ways to try, God, do we do this with viewports? Do, how in the hell do we get around this way that HTML is defined? Well, what I'm hoping is some responsible entity will modify a browser to reflect this kind of change. The browser will be released to find consequences and advantages, and if it's all good news, then the definition of HTML should be changed. And then it could join the ranks of useful document creation tools. This is a serious, serious problem, and it's a problem that actually could be solved. Uh, now, that's not all that's wrong. Uh, all the pages I showed you in the first um, in the first slide, were made by were made by d programs like InDesign and Illustrator. And in Illustrator and InDesign, you sort of have the full imaging model under your control, and you can do a lot of things. You ha can have you can have very sophisticated H and K H and J. You can have sophisticated hyphenation. You can have <laughs> all of the layout power that you need to do really good documents. 
HTML5 doesn't get there. And they did put in HTML5 some PostScript-like things. They put in Canvas, okay, that's one thing. And they put in SVG, but they left type out. That's crazy. Now, why would they leave type out? Well, because I think there, it's felt that the markup is really important. The markup of text is really important. You want to retain the structure, you want to retain the structure of the text wherever text occurs in the document. And I think that's a, actually a good idea. I really believe in style sheets. I really believe in marking things to, to have different looks and have those looks, looks be reconformable. But there are different ways to do that. Uh, so it occurred to me, what would I like if I had an authoring tool? Well, actually, I would like JavaScript because JavaScript gives you a huge amount of flexibility. But I need more than JavaScript. What I also need is a way to sort of lay out text easily from JavaScript. So what I would like is, gee, give me a JavaScript routine where I give it a, a section of HTML markup, okay, and I give it a sequence of outlines, and it takes the text from the markup and it puts it into the outlines and flows the text the way you want it to flow the text, and it does H and J. That would be great, but it needs in the background to build an object model that I can go back and say, where in the hell did the text land? Yes. It does. Where? In SVG it does? And does it do a good job of H and J? Does it allow for arbitrary rotation? That's good news. I will use it. See, I knew there was a reason I had to come to this conference. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that we live in a world where almost all the tools will have to deal across a large number of devices. And those tools, if they don't work, need to not necessarily be added to, but fixed so that they're in an, a useful environment. Uh, I would love to do all of this stuff on the web. Um, it's hard. And uh, I would like HTML to become one of those environments where we can get on. Uh, I probably haven't used all of my time, but uh, if there are any questions. I wrote a memo to Adobe uh, a couple of weeks ago sort of stating this case. You know, and it, it's amazing how it had not occurred to them that HTML was not device independent. It's just, it's amazing to me. Anyway, questions? No rocks throwing? <laughs> Uh, we, we were very aware of Metafont. Uh, no, uh, Don Canoe's work wasn't, he didn't change the outlines, he tried to figure out what bits to turn on from the, from the outlines, which actually led people to try to extend his work, and all of those, I, none of them worked very well. And the, the, the scheme that we came up with actually worked really well. Do yeah. you think you're going to persuade Adobe to come out with a sort of I'm asking, implementation? Yes, I am. Yeah. I'm, I would love it if Adobe would, in their browser, in the Air implementation, they have an Opera browser that they use, uh, change the implementation so that it's device independent. I, you know, if you start thinking about this and you think about your job as a designer, it makes life so much simpler to have sort of our, fixed size as a target. So if I'm doing for a phone, I would I'd go for a phone that big and design a document and then allow for scaling in the middle to take over the rest.
Oh, I would probably I would agree with you. Yes. Uh, I agree with that. And I think that you need to have, as I say, these flexible ways of reflowing text and, and repositioning items on the screen and knowing where they are. The, the New York Times thing. I think that's a very interesting approach. I asked Kevin Lynch about this, and he said there's a lot of hard programming going on in there. And, you know, I don't know that you can sort of statically, just with style sheets, represent the re design of a document in the way that you have to. I think you really need a programming language in there somewhere to help solve some of those problems and make decisions about certain things. And I, it, to a certain extent, it might even depend a certain on how the style of the document. I mean, you know, it's, it's a hard problem. I agree with you. But dealing with this morass is a pain. Uh, he, he says that it's a presentation language. It's not a great presentation language, but it's a document structure language. It is sort of a document structure language, but when it first came out, it was sort of a document structure. But then features have been added to give designers more and more control. You have things like layers. You have all kinds of crap that's been introduced to give people control over the look of the document. And I agree that you need document structure. I mean, I completely agree with that, but you also need control over design. But you put them both together in the same space. What do you need from the, the layer of the uh, what, what originally was part of the project? Well, everybody, so the, the, the tr typical SGML approach has been in the past, and you're, now you're hearing just my really biased opinions, so forgive me. The, approach in the past is, gee, you have this document structure layout thing that tells you the structure of the document, and then you have a DTD that tells you how you're supposed to represent this thing on the page. I don't typically believe you can do that with a static data thing. I would rather have a programming language over here and a document structure here and let them work together. That's what I would rather have. Okay, well thank you very, very much indeed, John. Well, super. <laughs>